Hello, welcome to the Friday, November 8th, 2019 edition of the Sands and its Storms on us Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Adobe released an update for its mobile software development kit that does fix a problem with how the software development kit was connecting to Adobe's cloud services by default. The problem here was a default configuration that shipped with the SDK and this default configuration did not use a TLS. It's actually not uncommon that in development environments, TLS is not used, not necessarily a great idea, but then of course you should adjust the configuration when you're moving applications live, which here apparently often didn't happen. So Adobe now released an update with more secure default settings for its SDK. Still, if you use this SDK or any other SDK, always verify the settings and make sure they're appropriate for your application. And QNAP continues to have issues in getting rid of the QSnatch malware that takes advantage of vulnerabilities, but also weak configurations like weak username and password combinations in QNAP's network storage devices. Yes, I'll say it again, you should not connect them directly to the internet, but still QNAP has some decent advice here. First of all, you should keep the software updated on these devices. And then they also now have a security counselor, which they just updated that will walk you through some of your configuration choices, as well as a malware remover that you can use to essentially check and remove commonly seen malware that's specifically does attack the QNAP device. It's a little bit different from sort of your generic antivirus check-in that it specifically looks for malware that's known to attack the QNAP device. QNAP's latest advisory that was released last week has some decent first steps uh, to make sure that your QNAP network accessible storage device is reasonably secure. And Trustwave's Spider Lab came across an interesting use of malformed zip files. Now, this is not an uncommon trick where an attacker is creating a file that appears to be invalid as a result is not correctly scanned by anti-malware, but if it's read by some software, it may actually get parsed. And that's exactly sort of what's happening here. What we got here is really two zip files that are sort of concatenated to each other. Now, you would think that a normal software will just extract the first file, it will find the end signature and then stop unpacking. Well, uh, that's apparently not what's happening here. According to Trustwave, there are a couple different behaviors that they observed. Well, first of all, the good news is that the built-in unzip tool in Windows, as well as WinZip, which is probably one of the more common tools that people use, does recognize uh, the zip file as invalid and basically just doesn't do anything with it and gives you an error message. However, there are a number of popular tools, like for example, Power Archiver, WinRAR, and 7-Zip that will unpack these files. So in this case, the first file was a benign image. The second file was a malicious executable. With 7-Zip, only the image is being extracted. With WinRAR, it displays the image file name, but actually extracts the executable. Now, newer versions of WinRAR, Power Archiver, and also old versions of 7-Zip, they will display the executable file name and extract it. So it's really sort of a little bit of crapshoot here as to what file you get, and in some cases you may not see the correct file name. Now, you may ask, how does the attacker know which particular unzip or uncompressed utility you're using? Well, sometimes they just don't care. They spread this out as spam. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Remember, attackers don't have SLAs. They don't need five nines. If they get one in a hundred, it's still not a bad day. 
And Bitdefender has an interesting vulnerability with Ring video doorbells. Nothing really uh, too severe, but very common with these type of devices. The problem here is how you get this doorbell to join your Wi-Fi network. And the way this accomplished it is that you set up the video doorbell in a configuration mode. This will enable a Wi-Fi access point within the doorbell, then you can connect to the doorbell using that access point and configure it. Of course, all of this happens in the clear and anybody in the vicinity of the process may be able to grab your data, in particular, the Wi-Fi password. Not really a huge problem because it's only happening while you're setting up the doorbell. An attacker, according to Bitdefender, could sort of provoke you setting up the doorbell by continuously sending the authentication vacation frames. Not really sure if this is a valid attack given that these systems are more likely going to be used in home networks where probably it's not that terribly difficult to just guess the Wi-Fi password. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening. Next week, you'll have to do with just four podcasts because Thursday, I'll unlikely be able to record it due to my travel schedule. Thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.